Hello friends and welcome back to our discussion and study of the book of Hebrews. Uh, I appreciate your interest in this topic. Uh, it is a very valuable book to us out of the New Testament and uh, tells us more about Christ and His, uh, and his life uh, as much as any of the Gospels. So Hebrews has been said at some point to be almost like the fifth gospel. It is the good news. It is the news of better things. Uh, and uh, An absolutely incredible book to study, and I appreciate your interest in this study. We're uh, beginning in chapter 10 of Hebrews. This is kind of the end of the grand middle section. We're probably going to spend a couple, maybe even three weeks on chapter 10 uh, before we move on to... Um, to the topic of faith in chapter 11 throughout uh, the rest of the book. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9 verses 1 through chapter 10 verses 18 uh, concludes the argument that Christ is the one and only high priest for believers. The Levitical priesthood uh, was really, really uh, weak and useless and uh, we will uh, study more about that in this section. The, the focus of this grand section is basically on Christ's priestly service in heaven uh, in the presence of God and his metaphorical offering of his blood uh, before the Father in the heavenly holy of holies in contrast to the Levitical priesthood and their offering of animal sacrifices in the uh, tabernacle and also uh, in the temple. As we look at the beginning of verse uh, uh, verse 1 of chapter 10, it almost seems like um, uh, repetitious uh, of what we have seen before. Verse 1, for the law, since it, it has only a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices year by year, which they offer continually, make perfect those who draw near. So we see this topic of comparison of the Levitical priesthood and the uh, fact that it's not really forgiving uh, anything. This seems like repetition, but really it is an opening section uh, of the new important point that uh, Christ's voluntary submission to do God's will of uh, sacrifice. Uh, chapter 9, verse 22 tells us that apart from sacrificial blood, uh, there is no forgiveness. According to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So you have to have shedding of blood in a sacrifice for forgiveness. But as we read on in chapter 10 here, starting with verse 2, uh, otherwise they would not have ceased to be offered because the worshiping worshipers having once been cleansed would no longer have had consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So we see without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. But it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to forgive sin. So where does this uh, leave us? Well, it offers the fact that Christ's offering of himself is the only remedy for sin. If it takes shedding of blood for forgiveness, but the blood of bulls and goats doesn't forgive sins, then what does forgive sins? Well, it's the shedding of the blood of Christ. So as we continue uh, in verse 5, therefore when he comes into the world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou hast not desired, but a body thou hast prepared for me. In whole burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the roll of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. So uh, this is a quote from Psalms. Uh, Psalms 40, verses 6 through 8, we will look uh, more at that here shortly. Uh, we see the ineffectiveness of the Levitical priesthood uh, ritual here is laid out again. The law was just a shadow of the good things to come. Uh, that's what 
the scriptures tell us here. It's just a shadow. The good things to come are the better sacrifices given in heaven by the perfect heavenly high priest. Because they've been offered for our sins, the good things have already come. Go back to chapter 9, verse 11. But when Christ appeared in high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation. So we see that uh, the good things have already come when Christ entered into this heavenly uh, holy of holies. The sacrifices under the law were just a dim outline, but it looked ahead or foreshadowed the real sacrifice. So we could look at it as a shadow, but also of a foreshadow uh, of things to come. It was an example for us. Uh, the ceaseless repetition of the Levitical sacrifices could never make perfect the worshipers. They tried to draw near to God, but the law perfected no one. Chapter 10, verse 2. Otherwise, they would have not ceased to be offered. Because the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have consciousness of sin. If the sin was taken away, why were they continually, daily, 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 uh, offering these uh, sacrifices? Uh, there was always a consciousness of the unsettled score uh, of sin. It was always there before them. You would think that the Day of Atonement would bring some relief. That was once a year when the uh, high priest would offer sacrifice for himself and then he would go into the Holy of Holies to sacrifice for the people to roll their sins forward for a year. Well, you would think that that would be some sort of release of consciousness of sins or the guilt of sins, but in fact, it was the day that they remembered all of their sins. Uh, it was the one day that of all the year that the Jews were commanded to fast and the whole nation confessed their sins. You can look at Leviticus chapter 16 verses 20 through 22, 29 through 31. They all came and fasted to be sorrowful for their sins. They were reminded of their sins which were not going to be forgiven but they were going to be pushed forward for a year. They were to come together and remember their sins. Um, we see that it was a reminder in chapter 10 verse 3. But in those sacrifices there is a reminder of sins year by year. This uh, next thought here, and uh, I do need to continue to give credit to uh, Neil Lightfoot for his commentary on Hebrews which is where I draw most of this study and most of the information. But this next point is really remarkable in the fact that the Jews were to be reminded to remember their sins. That's the only time in the New Testament that the word remember or this concept of remember is actually utilized. Except for when Christ asked his apostles and us to remember his sacrifice. Do this in remembrance of me. So the two times that remember this concept is used in the New Testament is for the Jews that had to remember their sins every year at the Day of Atonement. But we, on the other hand, remember the sacrifice that was given for our sins that took our sins away. So there is a great contrast in the remembrance of sin laid out here in the 10th chapter of Hebrews. Um, yearly remembrance, weekly remembrance of the one uh, who effectively, a yearly remembrance for the Jews, a weekly remembrance for us of the one who took care of our sins, that they would be remembered no more. Um, Verse 4 uh, caps off the fundamental point. The blood of bulls and goats doesn't take care of anything. That should settle the matter. Who would want to go back 
to that system that didn't accomplish anything. Animal sacrifices could not remove the guilt for sin. So why did God command these sacrifices? Why was this uh, ritual put into place? Uh, because God wanted the people to feel some responsibility for their actions and ought to do something or offer something for their sins to be reminded of these things. Uh, also, there are other things to consider. Uh, Moses' law did not make provision for all types of sins. We've discussed this before. Uh, in Numbers 15, uh, 27 through 31, only unwillful sins, sins of ignorance, sins that you didn't know you committed, those were the only types of sin that under the law you could be forgiven of. Number two, Christ's death reaches back in all effects to those who lived under the first covenant. Uh, we saw that in chapter 9, verse 15. And for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant in order that since death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So even with those animal sacrifices put in place, God had a plan for Christ's sacrifice that would go back and take care of those people under the first covenant. Even under the first covenant, even during the time uh, of the law and the time of Israel and Judah and of the divided kingdom, uh, the prophets told God's people that he wanted more than just blood, flesh, and oil sacrifices. We will look at numerous scriptures momentarily that make this point crystal, crystal clear. Uh, the old law, by what they couldn't cover, admits its, admits its own inadequacy and indirectly points where? To Christ. We see that there has to be something better. Jeremiah told us about it, that it's better. Uh, and we're going to see in this next section about the perfect sacrifice. Okay, uh, we read verses 5 through 7, which is from Psalms 40, verses 6 through 8, which is a major section, a beautiful passage. Uh, it's kind of a conversation between uh, the Son and God the Father, back and forth. Because the Levitical sacrifices were so ineffective, Christ resolves to come into the created world to do what? To perfectly fulfill, perfectly fulfill God's will of sacrifice. Okay? It's the real sacrifice. Uh, we can go back and read Psalms 40. This is almost an exact quotation of it here in Hebrews. Psalms 40 verses 6 through 8. Sacrifice and meal offering thou hast not desired. Now, this is coming from the Old Testament. My ears thou hast opened, burnt offering and sin offering thou hast not required. Then I said, Behold, I come, in the scroll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God, thy law is written. Where? Tables of stone? No. Thy law is written within my heart. Same concept of uh, no longer tables of stone, uh, written into the heart. Uh, because this Levitical priesthood was so ineffective, Christ here resolves to come into the created world to perfectly fulfill God's will of sacrifice. All right, so while we're here in Psalms, let's just look at a few passages from the Old Testament on animal sacrifice. We'll go to Psalms chapter 50. Let's look at verse 9. First, I shall take no young bull out of your house, nor male goats out of your fold. Shall I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of male goats? God didn't eat this flesh, drink this blood. What use has he got of this type of sacrifice? Look at Psalms 51, verse 16. For thou dost not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. Thou art not pleased with burnt offering. Isaiah. Let's just keep on looking here for a minute. Isaiah chapter 1, 
uh, verse 11 and the verses following is a long uh, section here talking about the requ God's requirement of a holy life, not just sacrifice. What are your multiple sacrifices to me, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams, the fat of fed cattle, and I take no pleasure in the blood of bulls, lambs, or goats. No pleasure. It's not doing any good. Let's go to Jeremiah 7. I mean, I only spend this much time here to make the point that the Old Testament, uh, in all of its sacrifices that not, could not remove sin, had other requirements. Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 21. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat flesh. For I did not speak to your fathers or command them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, except concerning burnt offerings and sacrifice. Amos chapter 5, verse 21. I hate, I reject your festivals, nor do I delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer up to me burnt offerings and your grain offerings, I will not accept them. And one that always rings clear to me is Micah chapter 5 no I'm sorry chapter 6 verse 7 does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams in ten thousand rivers of oil shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts this refers to the worship of the God Molech that people in their sinfulness were even sacrificing uh, their firstborn children at one point to this false god. Uh, so if we read these passages in full context, it's clear that a true heart of obedience, what does Micah say here in chapter 6 verse 5 after what we had just read, 10,000 rivers of oil, thousands of rams. Micah chapter 6 verse 8, he has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? This is Old Testament Scripture, Micah, 750 B.C. But to do justice, to love kindness, and to humbly walk with your God. You know, we can read these other passages that we have come to before. We'll go back to, to Psalms chapter 50. Uh, verse 14 where it says uh, uh, shall I drink the blood of bulls and goats male goats in verse 13 verse 14 says offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the most high Psalms 51 17 starting with 16, which we read before. Thou dost not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. Thou art not pleased with burnt offerings. Verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. So, even uh, in these Old Testament scriptures, we see written on the heart. We want the heart to change. Uh, it's like that apology that you make to someone that you don't really mean it. Just because you say the words, I'm sorry, that doesn't mean anything unless you truly are sorry, unless you repent, unless you turn, unless you change. Um, this passage in Psalms 40 is a classic statement of this concept. The coming Messiah knows the heart and will of God. He is God. He is a part of God. He's part of the Trinity. He knows the will. He knows the heart. He knows these other sacrifices could not atone. So the Son declares, Thou hast prepared a body for me. Thou hast prepared a body for me to come to earth and to sacrifice that body uh, that's the deal right there. Now, in this section in 40, the psalmist originally wrote these things about himself, David. Um, 
wrote this, but it is apparent that the uh, it reaches further to the sacrifice made by the Son who says, not my will, but thy will be done. I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. Thy law is written in my heart. That's Psalms 40, verse 8. So we see that Christ became human to take care of ineffective sacrificial stu uh, structure and to displace it by coming, uh, by becoming a free, loving sacrifice of himself. He takes away the first to abolish the second. That's what Hebrews, back in chapter 10, verse 9, then he said, Behold, I have come to do thy will, the will that is in my heart. I, I have come to do that. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. Well, it tells us right here that he has done away with the first. Uh, some of the terms that are used um, uh, is to destroy the first or to abolish the first. Uh, it's the same term that's used through the scriptures when Herod was going to try to do away with the Christ child, to destroy, to to kill him. Uh, it's the same uh, term that is used of the killing of Christ that the high priest and the chief priest were trying to do, to completely do away with Christ. So we see destroy, abolish. Christ came to earth, took on a body to have as a sacrifice a blood offering, not the blood of bulls and goats, but to completely annihilate the old law and the Levitical um, ritual of priesthood. So, we have the complete fulfillment of God's will. Uh, it's referred to in Psalms. It is the perfect obedience of Christ to do God's will. Will here we have, um, has two aspects. It's the will of God that this sacrifice be made, but it's also the will of Christ to come and do the perfect obedience of God. So we've got God's will and Christ's will coming together uh, as it says here in chapter 10, verse 10, for what reason? By this we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So what is this sanctification? What does that mean? It's a ritual cleansing. It is a, a cleansing in order to approach God in worship. Just as the priests of the old law tried to make themselves clean before they even came into the presence of God, this once for all sacrificed by Christ sanctified us that we may be clean to come before God to worship and to do His will. So, Jesus went to the cross and God forgave us for our sins once and for all and this is placed at the end of this sentence in chapter 10, uh, the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all to show the finality of the sacrifice of Christ for our sins, for the forgiveness of our sins. That God says he will remember no more. Okay, uh, we will continue next week with verse 11 through 18. Um, Lots of really good study information in this part of chapter 10. And this will conclude this grand middle section of the book of Hebrews. Then we will continue on with um, verses 19 uh, through 38 of chapter 10, which takes us into a new era, uh, a new section on faith, which is the better way. Faith is better than sacrifice. Thank you for your attention and look forward to next time.